Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. I want to show you the bench that we just completed. We've uh, been doing working on this during our hand and power tool workshop for the last year. It didn't take a year to build, but it took a year to film, considering we only do an hour and a half a, uh, a week, which is three half-hour episodes. Built this out of maple and mahogany, and I'm going to get to correct my cameraman to go through and highlight some of the stuff, so we'll hit the easy stuff first. The core is three inches thick. It's maple. All the pieces are glued with double splines. There's two long running splines, and that's primarily for alignment, so that when you're gluing these whole, all these pieces up, they, uh, they stay uh, really flush at the top. And what I do is each piece I hand plane before I glue it up so that I know which direction this particular piece needs to be planed in order to get the best result. And if you do that with every individual piece, then when you put it together, the final finish is just a very small amount of work, mostly with a smooth plane. I built this after uh, the uh, traditional Scandinavian style bench, which both Frank Claus and Tay Frid made po have made popular. I used the Scandinavian style shoulder vise up here, but I switched and used what was called a wagon wheel vise back here. I've done several benches, and this is a whole lot easier to build, and I like it. I think it functions a whole lot better. But I made a few small changes, and I'll point them out. Uh, I did this for a friend, and uh, I really wanted to dress it up and make it a, a, a beautiful piece. So all of the horizontal surfaces, and you'll see them. So, Frick, if you want to come around here, actually start right here. All the horizontal surfaces, I glued an eighth-inch piece of bird's eye, and I dug into my best stash to uh, get some of the prettiest and the most heavily figured wood I could find. So all the horizontal surfaces, including down here at the base, those stretchers are, uh, are encased in bird's eye all the way around. It's, that's hard maple underneath, bird's eye skin, top and bottom and inside. And we even, we did it up here. I even threw it in the, uh, in the bottom of the tool tray. I figured that it's not getting hard use and I wanted to make it really look nice. So bird's eye here, bird's eye at the bottom. Now let me go through and show you some of the other things. This is uh, simple, but you ha a bench lamp, especially as you get older, to me anyway, has become one of the most valuable tools. If you can't see the line, how can you saw to it? And benches that I built in the past, I simply drilled half inch holes along the back of the tool tray and the bench lamp would sit in there, but I was amazed at how it would hollow out, it would ruin those holes after a while. So I made this um, little mobile or movable clamp and then I turned a piece of bird's eye maple in the shape of a mushroom so that it doesn't wreck the small half inch base that these lamps come with. They're not very sturdy, so this way it's that stays stationary in the wood and it's the spigot that actually turns inside the mahogany. All right, so what else did we do? Well, if you look down in here, these ramps on the end of either tool tray are simply designed to make it easy to clean out. So if you're using a bench brush, you can just sweep the stuff out. But this solid core is going to move seasonally. So you've got, how wide is that whole thing is 17 inches, and you're talking about a 14 inch piece. That can move maybe as much as an eighth of an inch uh, from the driest point of the year to the most humid point. So when you build with using cross grain construction, this piece, this end cap, the only, there's no expansion this way, but this piece there is. So when you put these two pieces together, you have to allow for that. So what I did, I have three splines, three, I can't remember, were they quarter inch or half inch? I think they were quarter inch splines on the end of this core. And the three splines ensure that you, keep, you maintain a nice flush joint up here. The first two or three inches I actually glue, this bolt has a captured nut back up in here. Frick, you may want to go underneath and just have a quick look at that. So we've got a bolt sitting in, and there's a nut up in here, and I just use a router to cut that recess. And that nut, that bolt, is three-eighths of an inch in diameter, and it's sitting in a three-eighths diameter hole, both through the end cap and into this piece. So there's no movement here at all. You, don't, you can't afford to have this dimension change as a result of the expansion pushing into this section, because it will bind your, uh, your vise, and you can't have that. So all the expansion has to go out this way. So from here over to here, <coughs> it's a dry fit joint. This bolt sits in a larger diameter hole, so that allows for the movement. Well, your tool tray, the grain is running this way. 
and that's not going to move at all. So traditionally what they would do is they would leave a gap down in here and you would just live with it. It would be a narrower gap one part of the year and a wider gap at the other. Well, I didn't like that. So what I did, I took a little piece of mahogany, cut a groove in the end of this piece of mahogany and cut a piece of wood to match in the, the, uh, the width. I put two springs out of a couple of ballpoint pens in holes that were bored down in the bottom of the groove. And then this piece of wood in here is spring loaded. So as this closes down in the humid time of the year, that will simply move into the groove and allow for the expansion. And as this shrinks in the winter time when it's dry, this will come out to continuously fill the gap. A couple of, uh, same thing when I fastened this to the bottom, it's fastened solid on this screw. This screw over here has a, um, pardon me, did I say that right? I can't remember. One of them is in, a, is in a larger diameter hole and the other one isn't. So that the movement won't be affected. Actually, I think it's this one that stays tight. Yeah, that's right too, because this is a solid piece of wood as well. So this piece of wood is made fast, screwed and made fast to the bottom of the bench. The groove that it fits into in this back piece of mahogany is deeper than the amount that is actually projecting into it. So that will allow, as this comes this way, the tool tray can go in to this back piece. There's at least a quarter of an inch of movement in there. So when I fasten this to the tool tray, it's made fast over here and it's allowed to expand over here. Okay, um, what else? Oh yeah, let's do this piece. Something else that I changed that I hadn't done before is that typically this piece is left unsupported and you can sit here and move it a fair bit and that always bothered me. So I made this piece of, I took this piece of bird's eye which goes under all the way back to here if you look up underneath. Back come down here. So it's made fast back here with four screws and a little bit of glue. These four screws are in, again, larger diameter holes that allow for expansion. And then what I did, you, need, you have to come up here and look at this. I cut a, uh, the shape of this support is cut into the bottom of this core with uh, extra room at the end. So as this expands, it will just come over top, it'll slide over top of this support. And as it shrinks, it will go out, but it'll always remain nice and tight and closed like that. And then out here, on this end, we put a, uh, this is a, there's a tenon on the end of this, there's a mortise in here, and then true to the way I did all of the joints, I penned, uh, pinned it with a, uh, some walnut dowels. Okay? What else do I need to show you on the tool tray? I guess that's about it. Some don't like them, but I would much rather have my tools dropping into the tool tray than hitting the floor. Uh, the dovetails are cut by hand on these corners and it's a challenge cutting the big dovetails like that and I pin them again just for a little extra strength pin them top and bottom and we come along here the uh, hardware I, I designed the hardware not being satisfied with what was available over the years of building benches so I custom des I designed this and I had a custom machine shop make it for me so there's not a whole lot of difference in this end other than the fact that we used a double start threaded rod which simply means for every revolution for every two revolutions this it moves an inch on my other benches it's as many as five on one and six on the other so you get a lot of speed which really helps and the brass rings are just the way of fancying it up we actually took this T and polish it all up just to make it shiny. Now when you uh, when you have your handle there's a, it's constantly dropping down like that and what ends up happening is it breaks the end off. So what we did and, I, and Lee Nelson did this first so I copied it. A couple of rubber o-rings on either end just cushion the blow. This is a piece of mahogany, this is a piece, these end caps are bird's eye. So our, our um, uh, what do we call this? Our wagon wheel vise is a block of mahogany. This is made in uh, one, two, three, four parts, bolted together from the bottom side. And I don't know if you can see in there or not. I'll move this out. And... Frick, you want to come over on this end? You might be able to see it a little bit better. I don't know if you can see right down in there or not. But what we have are two grooves. They cut into this, into the core, and into this outside piece. They have to be the equal distance from the top. And then we have two pieces of, I think I used uh, bloodwood, which is naturally oily. And that, those two pieces of bloodwood, one's on this side, one that, one's on that side, are made to fit in that groove as, as with tightest tolerance as possible. And then there is a groove cut in this mahogany block 
Then it, the mahogany block is separated and then bolted together from the bottom side so that it squeezes on those two pieces of blood wood and they stay attached to the mahogany block but they slide in that track so that this always stays parallel to the top. Now let me show you the bench dogs because I did something different there. Um, the one thing about bench dogs is, uh, at least the ones that I've had in the past, Whatever means they had of holding them, preventing them from dropping down, usually only worked in a few locations. So if you were way up here, it wouldn't stop, it wouldn't stay put, it would drop down into the hole. So I did this. I took a piece of uh, bird's eye and I cut a T-shaped groove in it. And then I cut a piece of um, uh, blood, uh, not bloodwood, this is actually babinga, and that's T-shaped as well as you can see. Before I put it together, I drilled two holes, one here and one here took the springs out of a ballpoint pen and put them down in there. Now I, that, I lined up holes in the piece of uh, babenga, lined them up with the holes that were drilled in the bird's eye piece. Not very deep, just enough so that when you put it together, the spring would pop into that little depression in there, in there and that would keep this from falling out. And that, uh, that's just spring loaded, so when you put it down inside the dog hole, it'll stay in any position that you want. Now this was a screw up. I ended up having that dog hole right over top of the trestle, so I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be able to go down out of sight because as you'll see, if you look down underneath here, the bench dogs are longer than the bench is thick so that you can easily pop them up. So what I did on this one is I just cut it short, same thing with your, your little uh, spring-loaded wooden stay, and I just made a little re finger recess in there so that could go out of the way. And if you need it, just put your finger in there and pull it up. This one doesn't get used a whole lot, but it just works out nice with the spacing. And I put I leather line the jaws. This one doesn't really get used much, but if it does, the leather protects your wood and it just gives a little better grip too. All right, so we come along here. And uh, my spacing, first bench I built, the spacing was four or five inches of It might have been six inches apart. And I found out real quick that that was bad. So these are, uh, these are three and three quarter inches uh, center to center, which works out well. And this one, I rarely use that back one, but I put it in there anyway. Usually the front one's the only one that ever gets used. All right, we come up to this vise. So here's where I made the changes. With this style of vise, what you want is you want a little bit of swivel on the horizontal axis. That way if you're clamping a board that isn't perfectly, doesn't have parallel sides, it'll still stay tight. However, you don't want any forward droop or ver droop on the vertical because if you do, and this has been the problem, as your board comes up tight here, as this, the droop gets pulled up, it always moves the board out of position. And when I cut dovetails, I want my piece held in a very specific spot. So I simply designed a, uh, a threaded rod and a knuckle that would allow for this movement, but doesn't have any forward or, or droop on the vertical axis. And again, we use the double start so it moves nice and quick. Polished up the parts to make them look nice. And there's a little, there's a little uh, toe in here that fits into a groove. And all that's there for is, oh, sorry, so that when you're spinning this, this thing is not spinning around like a propeller. And the nut, the nut is really deep. It's a brass nut. It goes way back to here. And I wanted that so that there wasn't any droop in the threaded rod when it gets all the way out. So I, I've got a, it's, it's a little bit sticky right there. I've got to go back in and just take a little more material off right here. It's just a little bit too tight. And then it'll be good to go. So final little touch up. Now when you build this, there's a lot of cross grain construction. So what we've got going on here is this piece is opposing this piece and this piece. So when this went in, this is uh, only glued and, and made fast. There's triple splines on this joint and there's triple splines on this joint. So it's glued for the first couple of inches, both here and here. The rest of it has to allow it to, exp to expand. There's a bolt right here, and there's a lot of pressure put on this big arm. As you bear down on this vise, this wants to come apart. So there is a bolt right here that goes to about right here on the other side of what's called, this is the dog strip. It's built up separately and added onto the bench after you've done your, you're getting your core done. So this is a four inch thick piece, this is a three inch thick piece. And on the other side, in a captured hole, there's a nut that squeezes this together and prevents or fights the action of uh, the pressure being put on this as a result of the vise. And because of the size of the dovetail, I put in four, um, 
four uh, dowels. And when you put these in, you want to make sure they're not in the same line, which may cause a split. So that's why they're offset with uh, on this piece with the way the grain is. So, And that was a big dovetail to cut. I think I actually did one of these in the bandsaw. When we were filming our online workshop, I wanted to show them options that they had. So we cut one by hand with the handsaw, we cut one on the table saw, and I think we actually cut one on the bandsaw. Still a lot of handwork to fit it. And I decided to put in just a little bit of extra mahogany just as an accent piece to break up that joint. So I put in a piece of mahogany, but you'll notice that this piece of mahogany, the grain is running in the same direction as the core. So it's actually glued to the core, it's not glued to this side. And then when it stops here, it's actually, it's short grain this way and long grain running that way so that this one, this, these three pieces could all be glued together. Okay, now down underneath, come over here on this end. As I said, I've built a fair number of these and I tried to experiment each time to see what I like. And I really like Frank Claus style of bench, so the base underneath is all pretty much patterned after his, with a few minor exceptions. I've done uh, through wedge tenons on this, I've done bolts. Well, I like this keyed um, mortise and tenon the best. It's nice and fast. I used to travel and do wood shows a lot. One crack with this. Okay, 10 cracks with this. <laughs> if I might do it 15 more times. But that's just wedged in there and it's just a couple of taps and that pulls that singing tight. So it's a nice way of doing it. And I made it extra wide just so that you have lots of surface area. The base of this bench is actually made out of Spanish cedar. It looks very much like mahogany when it's done. But it's all I could find in this big thickness. So because it's a little bit on the soft side, I wanted to make sure that this wedge was sufficiently wide enough that it wouldn't cut a groove or leave a groove or a mark on this piece when, when these are driven in. All of the joints on these trestles are a double tenon. So instead of one great big tenon, because if you can imagine one big tenon on the end of this, it means a great big hole or a great big mortise in this piece, and it really weakens it. So what I instead I have is I have a half inch tenon over here on this end side and a half inch tenon over there. And that leaves material in between the two mortises. It just, I think it strengthens the whole piece. And it increase, increases the glue surface. But then what I do, after I put it all together, I pin it with, uh, in this case, walnut dowels so that uh, it's secure and it's not going to come apart. So you'll see these little black dots all over the place. That's what they're for. And I'll explain this in a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, these were done in maple and then I wrapped them in bird's eye. So there's bird's eye glued to the top, to the front, and to the inside edge. Actually, I might as well show you this now. The fellow, Bob, the guy that, the friend of mine that I built this for, wanted a bench that uh, gave him two heights. When you're planing, it's nice to be able to be over top of the wood so you can actually lean over it and put a little bit of pressure on the plane. However, when you're cutting dovetails, particularly as you get older, it's nice to have it at a height where you don't have to bend over. Well, the easiest way I could come up with to adjust this was to simply hinge another set of feet. So you lift the bench up, that foot folds underneath, go to the other end and do the exact same thing. And you gain three inches, you can gain four, depending on how big you make those, there really isn't any restriction. But now you're working up here and you're sawing at a higher level, you're chopping at a higher level. It's just a whole lot easier to work. Okay, down on this end. Actually, I'm going to bring this back down around. It needs a little bit of fancy footwork to do that, but it doesn't take terribly long to figure out how to do it. Okay, over here in our sharpening station. I prefer freehand sharpening. It's what I teach. It's fast. You can do it in 30 seconds. So you need a sharpening station that is convenient and very close by. This end of my bench doesn't get used for anything. So what I did is I built a little platform. It's made out of uh, exterior grade plywood because it's going to be wet as a result of the water. I put a little backsplash on there so it doesn't get all over the bench. And I actually built everything with about a one or two degree slope so any of the slurry will actually run off of this end. It's adjustable in height, but I like to be able to lean over top of my, of my stone so that I can uh, work pivot from my shoulder instead of my wrist, which is what you'd end up doing if you're sharpening at bench height. And as a result, Folks can adapt to it and they can be very accurate with their sharpening with very little bit of practice. As I said, sharpening is about a 30 second procedure, which means I'll uh, readily resharpen my blade the minute they need it. it needs it. 
Now, what else is there to show you on this? It's heavy. I'm guessing it's probably a little over 300 pounds. Uh, a lot of money tied up in materials, but if you're going to build a bench, I assume you're only ever going to build one. And why not put some pretty wood in it? It's what you look at all the time, so it's nice to have it. Nice to show off your uh, your skill and your craftsmanship too. Anyway, if you're interested in, in walking and in going through this, you can uh, become a member of our online workshop. It's the Hand and Power Tool Workshop. And we allow our members access to everything from when we started filming, when you sign up. It, uh, I think we, we went through an actual year. It was 178 episodes, I believe. 178 half-hour episodes. We filmed three a day, uh, pardon me, three a week. So we broadcast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Hand Tool Power Tool. They're, they're on there all the time, so you can watch them anytime you want, but a new one comes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And 170, whatever you said, 178. So there's a lot there, but uh, we tried not to do uh, much off camera. The only time we did anything off camera was when we filmed repetitive steps. We would do one or two on camera and then do the rest just to save time. But it's all on there and uh, it'll walk you through the process. Made a few mistakes. In fact, I'll admit this piece of mahogany is not there because it was going to be decoration. It's there because after we glued this whole thing up, we ended up with a gap and I couldn't live with it, so I had done this once before, I put it in there. And then once I put that one in, I realized, well, we really need to balance it. So we put a mahogany strip in both ends just to kind of dress it up. And it really worked in our favor, so. Actually, it wasn't a mistake, it was intentional. So that's it, that's our workbench. If you, uh, if you want to join us, if you want to just kind of get a little sample to see if this is something that you think you might want to experiment, but you don't want to put the money up front, uh, if you contact us, rob at robcosman.com, we will uh, we'll give you a free 30-day trial. You can go on there and see if you like it. If you do, great. If you don't, it just expires at the end of 30 days. All right. Enjoy your time in the shop.